it's Jeremy Fisher. I'm a uh, principal advisor for climate and energy uh, at Sierra Club. I'm based out of our Oakland office, uh, land of the Ohlone, um, and it is a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I am also a relatively fast talker, um, and I will apologize ahead of time uh, if the combination of being remote plus being a fast talker uh, gives us a little bit of uh, um, a little faster than we otherwise would have wanted. I'm going to be walking today through Project Tundra, which is a proposed project uh, for carbon capture and sequestration or utilization, not quite sure yet, uh, over at the Milton Young uh, coal plant um, over in the lignite fields of North Dakota. Um, and I'm calling this, um, obviously, our Halloween-themed uh, presentation today, Trick or Treat, It's Still Coal, because this is one of those cases in which we have a very definitively emitting facility that at the end of the day is still gonna be an emitting facility. Uh, so even though we've got some uh, costume that's potentially being put on here, it's still coal. Um, and I'm gonna be walking uh, over the next 10 minutes through uh, what we know about uh, this project that's being proposed. Uh, there are some emerging sources of information that are coming out about this largest proposed facility, uh, hands down for carbon capture and sequestration. So um, Project Tundra uh, is a project um, of the Minkota Power Cooperative. Um, it's uh, proposing to retrofit the uh, Milton Young Lignite Power Station, which we'll uh, find out just a little bit more about in just a moment. Um, but it's useful to have a little bit of context for who this is being proposed by, uh, because it lends actually a little bit of context to where we are and are not seeing carbon capture and sequestration proposals so far. This early stage project, and when I say early, this is one of the fastest moving uh, proposals and furthest along within coal carbon capture uh, retrofit, um, is being proposed by a cooperative, which uh, differ a little bit from investor-owned utilities in that they don't quite have, have as much transparency traditionally. Um, and this case happens to be run by a utility that has an extraordinary exposure to coal. So uh, just for, uh, and that's our second trick or treat, it's still coal. Uh, this is one of those spaces where if you're knocking on your doors um, and uh, looking for candy during our trick or treating and you always received just one single candy, we might be a little bit dissatisfied um, about that. Um, so uh, Minkota Power Cooperative serves 145,000 customers across uh, Minnesota and North Dakota. Um, it's weighted slightly towards its customers in uh, North Dakota, um, although more residential customers uh, in Minnesota. Um, it is a full requirements uh, provider for those uh, load distribution cooperatives. So for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, cooperatives, um, the full service providers are singular companies who are owned by their, in this case, entities. Uh, but those entities must buy their power or the vast bulk of their power from this generation and transmission company, in this case, uh, Minkota Power Cooperative. But almost all of Minkota's cooperatives load uh, is served by Milton Young Power Station. Increasingly, Minkota has been adding wind power purchase agreements, uh, but it also has external customers. So if we look at just its internal load and uh, its coal, it's almost entirely a coal-fired uh, uh, entity. And it's all coming from Milton Young, this single power station. So Milton Young is a uh, two-unit facility. It's got a smaller unit, 250 megawatts, a little bit older uh, from 1970, and then um, still old. Uh, older than me anyway, uh, the Milton Young uh, Power Station number two, 495 megawatts. It's owned by the sister company of uh, Minkota, but effectively both of these units are owned and operated by Minkota. Like many lignite mines, or like many lignite uh, coal plants, it has a uh, continuous contract uh, with a single lignite provider. Uh, in this case, the center mine, which is adjacent, um, and for those of you tracking in Minnesota, uh, the center mine is actually owned by ALET, um, i.e. Minnesota Power, um, and that has a contract with uh, the Milton Young Power Plant through the end of 2037 uh, for basically a fixed uh, cost contract. Um, like many lignite plants, it has a particularly poor heat rate, uh, 12,000 uh, BTU per kilowatt hour. Sorry, the, there's a little misnomer in there. Um, and while the units are controlled for SO2 and NOx, those controls are relatively older um, and only an electrostatic precipitator for particulate matter. Um, so a lot of CO2 emissions coming off of this and quite a lot of uh, NOx and SO2 as well. So the 
Project Tundra um, is proposed as an additional island for carbon capture and sequestration that gets attached to Milton Young. Um, and this project has been proposed for quite a while. It was actually first uh, thought about in 2017 and 2018, but they initiated a study with the Department of Energy in 2019, and the first phase of it was actually just completed this year. Uh, the project appears to have gone through a dramatic enhancement, um, or sorry, dramatic acceleration after the enhancement of the 45Q tax credit. That tax credit has been mentioned a number of times so far, but we're going to get back around to that one. That is a kicker. Uh, it is really pushing the pace of carbon capture and sequestration projects and carbon capture and utilization projects as well. But from the most recent feed study results, we're finding out, and as well from uh, a draft EA, that this is going to be a project that attempts to sequester or pull in uh, 13,000 short tons of CO2 per day, which is interesting because it's actually only sized to one of the two units. It's sized to be able to pull in uh, CO2 from unit two, but a little bit more than that. So also a little bit of unit one. Um, and that's actually important from a uh, legal definition standpoint. We'll wrap back around to that in just a couple of minutes. Um, it's expected to cost just under $2 billion to actually construct. Um, and result in a cost of around $80 per ton of CO2, uh, which is also an interesting number because it's just at the threshold of this 45Q tax credit where it costs around, where the 45Q tax credit is expected to yield $85 per ton um, for CO2 that you've captured and successfully sequestered. It's not clear whether the CO2 is going to be sequestered uh, locally or shipped over for EOR. Uh, both of those are still being explored uh, by the company last we checked, whether it gets shipped over to Summit for EOR or put into a local uh, sited um, injection well that's still being permitted. We're still waiting for that final investment decision. Um, as I noted, uh, Project Tundra is proposed as an additional island that would capture emissions from both stacks. Um, you know, It's based on a technology that at least has been attempted in uh, some other spaces. It's used within LNG facilities as well as uh, ethanol, this amine-based process where it heats and cools a solvent to separate CO2 from the flue gas. But that heating and cooling process is extraordinarily energy intensive. Uh, so think of this as a parasitic load. You know, the amount of energy that it takes from the actual unit to pull the uh, to heat up the solvent, pull the CO2 off, and then cool that solvent back down again um, uses close to the entire energy output of unit one. So about 40% of the overall amount of energy that would be produced by a facility using carbon capture and sequestration gets turned into the energy just to run the carbon capture and sequestration unit itself. So even if you have a high level of capture, you have a lot less energy that you're producing, which makes it look like a much lower efficiency uh, facility at the end of the day and actually quite high emissions relative to the amount of energy that you're getting out at the end of the day. Um, unfortunately, the way that the 45Q tax credit is structured, it actually doesn't care how much energy you get out of it at the end of the day. It only cares about how much CO2 you ultimately ended up capturing, um, which really comes down to a subsidy for the amount of coal that you're burning. Um, in addition to the amount of energy that it takes to run this thing, it has an anticipated water use that would basically double Milton Young's water consumption. Um, so they're already looking at um, additional permitting uh, from the state that would pull in an extra 2.1 billion gallons per year, uh, appropriating water from the Missouri River. Right now, Milton Young itself uses once through cooling from Nelson Lake, um, but we put an estimate together that's about two and a half billion gallons per year. So this is literally doubling the water consumption from that coal plant. So I noted earlier uh, that one of the interesting components of Project Tundra is that while the project proponents talk about it being a uh, proposed for 90% capture, um, it actually only is going to capture, uh, if it works, CO2 from one of the two stacks. And it's being proposed as an island that sits adjacent to Milton Young's both stacks, where the emissions from both stacks would get filtered through this unit, and it would pull off some of the CO2 effectively from both. It's being designed uh, such that it could uh, pull off the CO2 from effectively the entirety of one of those two stacks, but then just the partial from the rest of it. Um, 
And uh, actually in its draft environmental assessment, it talks about these two cases where it's either all of unit two and a quarter of unit one or all of unit one and about half of unit two. And what's interesting about that particular uh, claim is that it is uh, appears to be designed to skirt around one of the components of the 45Q tax credit where there are relatively few guardrails, but one of the guardrails is that you have to design your carbon capture and sequestration such that it is able to capture at least 75% of baseline emissions from that particular unit. And so the proponents of this particular project are claiming, well, it will capture 90% of emissions from one of the unit and then just a little bit extra from this other one. Well, one of the problems with that particular outcome is that we end up providing effectively a production incentive for whatever unit is the secondary unit here. We're adding a little bit of extra money to its operating schema because it's getting a 45Q tax credit. And so therefore, if it was operating at 70% before, now it's going to operate at 100% all the time because the more you burn, the more you earn with the 45Q tax credit. Um, and so this is a particular problem because this is being designed effectively as a partial capture mechanism that could have the outcome of certainly not decreasing emissions as much as possible and possibly even increasing emissions depending on how effective it actually is. At the end of the day, when it really comes down to it, the resulting emissions rate is about, 40, uh, about half a uh, ton of CO2 per megawatt hour that will come out of this thing. Um, so while it's being proposed for all of this grandeur of about a $2 billion project, at the end of the day, it's going to have emissions equivalent to a stack emissions equivalent to about a gas-fired power plant. So I'm just going to end with a couple of stats here and then turn over to the next panelist. Um, you know, this 45Q tax credit that we've mentioned a couple of times, it's a uh, $85 per metric ton. Um, and the break-even per project tundra in the initial on paper uh, is about $80 per metric ton. Um, if we sort of look at all of the other various costs that are expected to go into it, it looks like it may not even break even. So it'll be curious to see whether it actually even gets past this next stage of financing. Um, overall, over the 12 years of the tax credit when it's available, uh, it's expected that it could consume up to $4.6 billion worth of taxpayer dollars um, in 45Q tax credit. And again, mentioned that this tax credit is effectively a production credit. The more you burn, the more you earn. And so it acts as a subsidy to the operational cost of the unit. And so I'm estimating that this unit would actually dispatch into our local energy system here at around negative $60 per megawatt hour, possibly trying to push out other clean energy that's trying to come into the system. Uh, if we're looking at this uh, unit after it's got the uh, carbon capture and sequestration on it relative to uh, a shutdown scenario, um, it's about the same emissions. If we were to reduce its use after 2030 and ultimately have this unit shut down in 2035, we're about coming out with the same thing as if this carbon capture project actually operated. But there's an additional problem with carbon capture and sequestration under the 45Q tax credit, which is that after 12 years, the tax credit goes away and you no longer have an incentive to keep capturing CO2 at all. And because it's so remarkably expensive to operate, you probably just sort of shut it down if you're going to continue operating the coal plant. So if this plant continues operating through the end of its anticipated life, then even if we uh, stick on CCS at this point, we'll have 44 million tons in excess CO2 emissions relative to a 2035 retirement. So um, I'll be happy to answer additional questions. There's a lot that goes into uh, what we know about Project Tundra, um, but happy to dig more into it during Q&A.